Hello and welcome to Tiny Code Christmas Day 9. Today we're going to be looking at the classic demo scene effect, the shade bob. Oh, wrong bob. Um, the shade bob. And in addition to taking a look at this in Tick80 and Peak 8 in Tick80 we're also going to take a look at the peak and poke memory functions as well. So we're going to start with Tick80 and you can skip ahead for Peak 8 so the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at some organic movement for our X and Y coordinates here. So I'm going to use the technique that we introduced yesterday, this is your curves, where we essentially get the sine and cosine of different angles and plot them as if they were a circle and it ends up going all sorts of different ways. So instead of using sine and cosine, since we're getting the, the sine of different angles, it's not going to make too much of a difference. So it will actually save us some bytes when we go to make this smaller if we don't use cosine. So we want to take a look at these values in action and I'm going to use circle XY, I'm going to give it a radius of 5 and color 2. And we'll just take a look at these values that I put in here. And obviously they're modified by the time so that we get a different angle every frame. So that looks nice and organic. And again, you can see from the differences here, if I just maybe make that 2 and 3. Um or 1 and 7 that you can get all sorts of different types of motion and to make the path a little clearer what I'm going to do is remove the CLS and you'll have to do this as part of the effect anyway I'm going to clear the screen once outside of the function outside of the tick function and then inside the tick function I'm just going to draw circ so you can see here that it doesn't clear the screen and it continues to draw the circles so that is one potential movement pattern that you can get and I'll change this to maybe five and eight and you see you get something like that so they're good to mess around with and to pick out something that's particularly nice I'm gonna stick with these values they're multiplied by 110 and they're multiplied by 60 so that sign value is going to give me a value between obviously minus one and plus one and when I multiply that by 110 that will either add or subtract a maximum of 110 from 120 and 60 is the same that'll be plus or minus 60 and 68 so that is our pattern that we're going to go with here and it's nice it covers pretty much a good good coverage on the screen and it's not a pattern that's going to repeat itself until it has done most of the screen as well which is a which is a good one so it's actually going to going to give us good mileage in our effect rather than just piling back up on top of itself now one thing that we have to do is we have to actually read every pixel and then we have to get that color we have to add one to the color and we have to write it back to the screen so we're not going to be using circ or rect or any of the built-in functions to do that because they don't have the support for it and instead what we're going to do is we're going to write our own code to draw a rectangle um well we're going to draw a square technically but this should be no problem to you since we wrote our cls clone in the early days of tcc instead of doing it for each pixel on the screen we're just going to do it for a minus four to four minus four to four and i'm going to plot these pixels so that'll be x plus i y plus j and i'll just give it the color two and now we can see that we actually have a square moving around the screen and that is a bit easier to see if i clear the screen so your challenge is to modify this code here so that it reads the color and you can use the pix function to read the color as well check the documentation add one to it and use the pix function to put that new color back on the screen and then you have some choices as to whether you want it to wrap around so it goes 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 and goes back to 0 or whether it stops at 15 as it did in our example so the second challenge is to keep it to a maximum of 256 characters and we're going to make an assumption there that you might want to play around but adding a palette 
and we're going to talk about that as part of the section on the poke function uh, shortly. There are some expert challenges up on the website that you can tackle as well. The character limit for that is 128 and there is some extra criteria there as well. So make sure that you check it out. And we are going to take a look at the peek and poke functions and we're going to take a look at how they work. So first thing we're, that we're going to do is we are going to poke the video RAM in TIC80. So starting at memory location zero, the VRAM for the TIC80 is laid out and we can, we can access the screen memory by using the poke function. So instead of using the PIX function to set a pixel, I can poke memory location zero with two. And if I run it, you'll see that I have set the zero memory location, which is X zero, Y zero, to that color two. Now, I've also set the next pixel to black, and that happens because when we're using the poke function, it will write eight bits. The colors in tick 80 are only four bits, uh, zero to 15. You only need four bits to represent the colors, uh, the color index in tick 80. So when we poke, we're poking eight full bits. Now I can specify four in the poke function like this. And now I can, let's say, move to pixel number one, number two, etc. And we'll see that it will only write four. We can, of course, use the poke four function instead. And that will save us one character when we want to work with the screen memory. Um, you can, of course, use shift operators and R things together to write the full eight bits of color, but it's easier to just use the poke four function specifically so that you're poking in four bits of memory. The memory addresses that we would have to access if we're using poke four are then essentially halved because instead of accessing memory location one, which is eight bits, memory location two, which is eight bits further on from that, memory location three, which is eight bits further on from that. Again, we're going up in four. So memory location one will be four bits from zero, two will be four bits from one. So in order to access a specific memory location, if you need to with poke four, you essentially have to double it because you're counting in fours instead of eights. So let's revisit our clear the screen function that we wrote back on day three. We use the PIX function to clear the screen. And now we're going to do the same, but we're going to use a for loop. We're going to use i equal to zero, three, two, six, three, nine, do. I'll add my end. And I'm going to poke into memory address i, the color two. So now we've written some clear screen code that uses the poke function to set the pixel color of the screen instead of the pix function or instead of using the clear screen function. Now that's easy when the memory is laid out in a linear fashion, but what do we want to do if we need to visualize things with, let's say we want to use an X and Y loop. How do we organize the location? So, so let's replace this with two for loops, one for the Y and one for the X. So we have Y equals zero. Two one three five. We have x equals zero to two three nine. And so to poke these particular values, it would be to to map these x and y coordinates to the linear memory. It'll be x plus y multiplied by two forty. And if we run that everything is great. So whatever our x value is, we need to take our y value and multiply it by 240 to get which particular line we're at. And then we use the x value to move it in to that location. Now we're using poke four. Let's say if we bring back in our little curve that we were working on earlier and just use an x and y value to move something around. So bring it back to 120 multiplied by the cosine of t plus 110 and y equals 68 multiplied by the sine of t plus 60. This should give us a nice sine motion and I'm just going to 
type these out fully. So this should give us a nice motion. Let's see what happens. So what we're seeing here is one of the differences between the picks function and the poke function. So let's just comment this out and let's just go picks x, y, 2. And we get what we, we, we would expect. What is happening with poke? Why is it giving us this garbage instead of the nice smooth curve? And the answer is this here, mat.sign, mat.cos. The x value isn't too much of a problem because we're just adding x, but we're multiplying y. And the sine and the cosine are going to give us back numbers with decimal points. And when we take a number, even if it has a, a decimal point, point 0.1, and we multiply it by 240, that number is going to be way out. We need to make sure that our y value is floored. So that's just something to look out for. If you're getting a lot of random movement or garbage when you're working with the poke function, just make sure that your value that you're basing your calculations off is actually uh, an integer or at least a number that doesn't have any fractional decimals on it. So that's how you update the VRAM directly using poke. What we're going to take a look at now is setting the palette. So I am going to adjust this lovely code here and I am going to go back to um, I equal to zero. 0, 2, 3, 2, 6, 3, 9. And I am going to set i equal to i mod 240. That gives me this lovely gradient that I'm going to use for testing the palette. So the palette resides at this memory location. And the palette is 16 RGB colors. So that is 16 24 bit RGB colors. And to set the palette, we usually use something like um, j equal to 0 to 47. And again, that's 16 by 3, 0 to, to 47. Do. And we will usually poke. So poke in this instance is going to be something that is the full byte because we are working with RGB colors. So I can set every single color here. So 0x, 3fco, and let's say I want to make the most unoriginal tick 80 palette ever, um, plus j. And now I have set every single color in tick 80 to black. So all 16 of them, I have just wiped them out with zero. And I can do the same here and set it to 255. And now every single palette, every single color, if I comment this out, this is what you should be seeing. But I've overwritten every single color with white. Great. So one handy palette to know is just to multiply that by five. And it gives us this nice black to white-ish kind of a shade. And we can trace what this is doing. So it's setting the first RGB color to uh, zero times five. The next one is one times which is five. And the second one is 10. So that RGB color is zero, five, 10. Not exactly black, but good enough. And why are we multiplying it by five? So 255 is the max value that we can use here. So if we multiply 47 by 5, we get a value that's close enough to 255 to give us that range of colors. So instead of the hexadecimal memory address for the palette as well, we can use 16320, and that will save us a character. The byte battle section on the sizecoding.org wiki, um, link in the description, has a range of different palettes that are ready to go and you just have to set them up with a for loop 
like this. So for example, I'm just going to pick a random color from the Byte Battle page, a random palette, and it has them all organized by the length that they take. And if I run this, you'll see that we get this nice blue palette, but this first palette, also from the size coding org wiki is the basic black to white gradient that we saw already so just to demonstrate this a bit better that it is actually rgb components i'm actually going to poke one six three two zero um plus zero and i'm going to set that to two five five i'm going to poke the same plus one with zero and I'm going to poke the same plus two with zero. So 255 red, zero green, and zero blue. And that's after I've set the palette up here initially from black to white. So now I'm setting the first color in the palette to red. And you can see now that that has been successful. And you can set any RGB color that you want you can go into Microsoft Paint and pick out a nice color and copy it in here um, painstakingly line by line. But you can see that the amount of characters that were after taken up here just to change that one color to red, this is not optimal. There are other ways you can do things. And again, check out that Byte Battle page on the Size Coding Wiki. So we're going to leave it there for today. Try and make use of these new functions in your Shade Bob today. So let's take a look at our shade bob in Pico 8. So the first thing that I've set up here is I have X and Y coordinates for my motion. So I'm centering it in the middle of the screen. I'm adding to it a cosine value of the time divided by 3.4 multiplied by 60, time by 2.2 multiplied by 60. These are just numbers, mess around with them to see what works. And the whole idea here is that you're essentially taking the sine and cosine at different rates so you have different rates of the sine going up and down it will be different to the cosine going left to right it will still be a sine motion if you take it in isolation and the cosine will still be in a cosine motion in isolation when you add the two of them together you get a much more complex behavior than just a simple circle so i am going to plot this and you notice that i have a cls up here before my loop so the screen is cleared once and only once at the beginning and I'm going to set X Y I'm going to give it a radius of 3 and I'm going to give it a color of 2 and I'm going to run that and we can see that we have our circle in motion around the screen now the circle is just the easiest way to visualize this motion for now but what we need to talk about now is the actual shade part of the the shade bob where it actually does the additive blending where it takes the colors that are there underneath the object and essentially increases them by one. Now this is difficult to do with a circle so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how we might draw a square pixel by pixel individually because none of the built-in functions in Pico 8 have this additive blending mode that would allow us to add the color on top of or to increase the color count by one at a certain pixel. So we are going to have a for loop. Um, I'm going to use i and j for this because I've already used x and y. Minus 4 to 4. j equals minus 4 to 4. End. End. And all I have to do is use p set, and that'll be x plus j and y plus i. Because again, we want to center it based on the x and y coordinates and then we'll add the minus four to plus four in each direction and i need to set this a color i set it two and if i run this we now have a square that is in motion around our lovely screen the additive part is up to you though so you have to figure out how do i add this color on top of it